Well, good Thursday to everybody. Hope this finds you doing well. I've had two interesting conversations this week. Let's talk about that. Of course, this is our parenting Q&A. My name is Larry Underwood, and Dino and I are actually getting ready for uh, a Q&A next Wednesday that we're gonna do live again, so that's gonna be a lot of fun. But uh, I just wanted to tell you about a couple of conversations slash questions that I've had with other parents. These happen to be parents of teenagers, and in both cases, trust was broken. Of course, like all teenagers, it revolved around cell phone usage and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Almost every parent has experienced this, especially if you're parenting a teenager. Essentially, there are things set into place for your kid, like we told our son James, no Snapchat. Well, a couple of times over the last few years, he's found a way to get Snapchat back on his phone. Here's the scenario. You, you tell your student, no to something in particular like Snapchat, and then they go behind your back and they find a way to do it on another device, or they find a way to do it on their phone, and next thing you know, they're back on Snapchat. Um, and they might not even be doing anything wrong, it's just the fact that you said no, they're still doing it, trust is broken. And, and the question is, what, what do we do? Obviously, behavior needs to change, and there are particular reasons we don't want students, guys and girls, doing particular things online, sending pictures, sending uh, messages that uh, even if they're, they're funny or even if they're not intended to hurt somebody's feelings, uh, maybe they could be misconstrued or, or stored to use against the student later on, and, and none of these are good scenarios. So the question is, what do we do after trust is broken? Well, if you're not familiar, I have a blog, LarryUnderwood.com, and this week's blog post was dedicated uh, basically to that question. And, and the whole idea is to really understand that, that God loves your student. Doesn't matter if it's a middle schooler, if it's a high schooler, uh, God absolutely loves them and, and he's pursuing their heart. So if God's pursuing their heart, what is our job? Well, I think our job is to help communicate God's love and to communicate the gospel and, and leave them with an understanding of that as much as it is to have rules and boundaries and all of the things that are also very good. So my, my answer to the question is less of a, here's exactly what you need to do to you know lock down a student's phone or to ground them for a particular amount of time or to make them do X, Y, and Z as, as penance to earn your trust back. Um, it has less to do with that and more with the idea of how are we communicating the gospel? How are we communicating that, that God loves you that, that we, as your parents, as people that are taking care of you, that we love you, that forgiveness is real and forgiveness is instantaneous. Uh, and, and these are very important things because if we're communicating that, yes, you, you did something wrong, but you have to earn, a lot, not just trust back, but you have to earn your way back into good graces, um, that, that's a very confusing thing, especially for a middle school or somebody that's early in high school, uh, somebody that might not necessarily understand the gospel and somebody that, that might have been in church even a lot but hasn't necessarily committed their life fully to Christ. So for parents, it becomes really, really apparent that, hmm, that was funny, that our job is the heart of our child. God wants that child's heart, that student's heart. So God has our heart, and we have to facilitate the child understanding that, that my heart is my heart. And this relationship with Christ that we're talking about, it's not just this hand-me-down like my parents have it and then they're just going to hand it to me. No, it's a direct connection between your child and and God, and then they are taking care of their heart. It is so important to be able to do that. I'm gonna read a couple of verses out of Proverbs chapter three. This is uh, verses three and four. They read like this. Never let loyalty and kindness leave you. Tie them around your neck as a reminder. Write them deep within your heart. Then you will find favor with both God and people 
and you will earn a good reputation. That's a brilliant proverb, and it starts with the idea of loyalty and kindness, which are, in my opinion, two foundations of love. And what we need to be loyal to, especially in God's kingdom, is loyal to Jesus, loyal to accepting the fact that he sacrificed for us on our behalf, for our atonement, our forgiveness, our salvation comes from what he did, not what we did. But because of that, we have the freedom to reciprocate. And the idea of reciprocating is where I think a healthy heart comes from. So helping your student, helping your child understand that concept is going to be a very, very big thing. Here's where it's tough as a parent. Our actions, like what we do and what we say, have to line up with what we're asking our children to do and say and even on the behavior side of it if you look at it as a behavior modification so to speak uh, the end result obviously we want that child to have a relationship with god but at the same time we understand that if we are pursuing holiness if we're in a relationship with god the byproduct is going to be not doing certain things the byproduct of pursuing holiness is to look more like christ now, if in our own life we are not putting that first and foremost, it's very, very difficult to communicate that and pass that down to our children. As tough as this is to get, as hard as this is to um, actually do, a huge chunk of our faith revolves around the idea that we are trusting God with our lives, we're trusting God with our students' lives, our children's lives, and we're willing to say, thank you, God, for loving us, despite our failures, despite our sin. Forgive us for failing. Forgive us for our, our thought life. Forgive us for everything that we have going on right now today that isn't what you want us to be doing. Help guide us closer to your will. <laughs> Imagine sitting down with your teenager right now tonight and saying, I want God to guide me closer to God's will. Will you be on that journey with me? And imagine your student saying, that's not a bad idea. What is God's will? Imagine the conversations that come out of what is God's will for my life? I closed the blog post uh, for this week. Uh, that's again at LarryUnderwood.com uh, with the idea of eternity and how sometimes we look at life and we look at it like right here and right now and sometimes it's easy to look ahead a little bit or look at our future but sometimes we bookend our future with our you know physical death and i think if we look at life in the kingdom of god as something that is much more eternal i think the purpose of our soul becomes the question and so if the purpose of your soul is the question then the purpose of your student or your child's soul is also the question and believe it or not, people have imaginations. Your teenager has a great imagination right now. Imagine if their thought life was thinking in God's kingdom. If they were thinking outside of the bookends of even a physical life. Sometimes it, it seems like these are hard conversations to have, but they're surprisingly easy. Step one is start having those conversations. Next week's blog post, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about eternity and what that looks like, what that feels like. Thanks again for watching. Again, when you are parenting your teenager, communicate the gospel, communicate God's grace, make sure they know how much you love them and how much God loves them. Until next time, thanks for liking, commenting, subscribing, sharing, and all of those things.